Well, some other things that are interesting, you know, whether games. And then what about Schmetz? Is it real or is it just, just uh, a figment of my imagination? Uh, uh, how much does a game have to be played? There are just as many <coughs> truths about Schmetz as there are about chess. So if, uh, uh, if we get into the whole issue of fictional objects and so forth. Then there's things that we got games and championships. What kind of a thing is a championship or an opportunity? <coughs> it turns out that ordinary language is just brimming with <coughs> categories, of, as it were, nouns that we very unproblematically talk about. I mean, use, and we don't talk about them, we, we use, not, men uh, not mention them, uh, to talk about all sorts of things. And uh, the, on the ontology at issue is uh, curiously uh, unexamined, uh, but there could be examined. Uh, I chose opportunities because uh, John McCarthy, uh, founder of the AI Lab at Stanford and uh, one of my uh, uh, friends and in some sense heroes, uh, uh, we devoted a good week talking about whether if we change the ontology of certain artificial intelligence programs to include opportunities as a major category, whether this would help solve the problem. And it's not an idle it's not an idle suggestion. It is a deep and, and interesting suggestion. And the use of the term ontology in, in computer science and artificial intelligence is uh, one of the most interesting and, and potentially fruitful uh, uses of that term that I've encountered. It's one of the things that makes me think that maybe there's a, there's a role for ontology coming through computer science if we have a proper reason. Mistakes, another nice category. What about songs? We're getting to bird song. Fine, that's <laughs> And the difference, for instance, between songs and tunes. Um, there's a mountain of copyright law about this and about what constitutes a tune and what doesn't. And of course, it's vexed and contextual bound and so forth. But these are these are issues that are serious substantive issues in the manifest image in the world we live in. And the question is whether we need to have uh, any kind of a theory, an ontology, that explains the status <coughs> of things like songs and tunes and games and opportunities. Uh, uh, they're certainly not going to fit in any easy way into uh, a physics. And then there's words, which is the one that I've been thinking about the most recently. So, um, how many of you think words exist? <laughs> now, <laughs> there's something uh, weird <laughs> about this claim, <laughs> and, and some people might think, well, the way you prove that words exist is, uh, remember Hintica's lovely paper about Descartes and uh, I do not exist being a pragmatic self-contradiction and that this is the heart of the cogito. Somebody might say that there's a similar sort of argument can be used to show that words exist. The very attempt to deny it uh, seems to uh, uh, belie the attempt. So let's, but I do think that words exist. But I don't think that's the way to prove it. I don't think that is at all the appropriate way to, to prove it. The way to prove it is more the way uh, James and, and Don want to handle these things, by looking at science and the role of science with and without words and seeing that words are so, I would say, obligatory as a category if you want to do all the uh, prediction that's available uh, in, in the world, uh, that you, uh, you, the patterns, that the real patterns that words are engaged in are just uh, uh, unignorable and, and, and necessary. Well, if words exist, do beliefs exist? Because I think actually words are in rather better shape than beliefs. Uh, 
mainly because of a problem that I know that says in the Bible. Um, these questions, like the question of whether beliefs exist, I have argued that these questions are almost a sort of diplomatic questions. Now, what I mean by that is something that I expressed in a little, little story in, in Brainstorms uh, back in 78, and I'm just going to remind you of it because I haven't changed my mind about that example in spite of James and Bowen's book. And, and it involves anthropologists in a way. We go to some part of the, some, some isolated corner of the world and we find people who speak a, speak a variety of English Except that where we speak of being tired, bushed, you know, they talk about having fatigues. And uh, they have lore about fatigues. They say, you know, uh, in, uh, among the boxers, they say, you know, uh, uh, a fatigue in the legs is worth two in the arms. And the kids wonder, you know, when you go to sleep, where do the fatigues go? You know? Is this the same fatigue come back today as was here yesterday? So, so I just want you to imagine that they have this, this ontology that manifestly includes fatigues. And so we come and we uh, uh, sit down with them and tell them a little bit about all our wonderful science. And they want to know what fatigues are. Tell us what fatigues are. Notice this is like saying, well, what are colors? Or, for that matter, what are words? What are fatigues? And we've heard of cough and spider. Well, you know, you know, there aren't really fatigues. And they laugh at us and they say, you don't know fatigues. Run around the block. You'll know fatigues. You know, I can feel it. I can recognize them. They are as real as real can be. So then we might sputter and cough and then go into some bizarrely gerrymandered identification of fatigues as some sort of weird state of uh, 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 oxygen deprivation and blah, blah, blah. And it would be uh, of no scientific interest. It would be uh, an attempt to uh, sort of over-dutifully uh, cast in their terms what we knew in much better terms in our own science. So I think that uh, recognizing the, the, the sort of uh, likely ineffectiveness of both of those policies, we might sigh and then say, well, all right, let's just have a good long chin wag here about the nature of science and the nature of conceptual schemes and the manifest image and the scientific image. And we would try to get them to see that there was a better way of looking at things. And that would be a diplomatic effort. This is, this is an effort in, in sort of pedagogy of negotiating between one conceptual scheme of sorts and another. And if that's right, then I think, as it were, there's no right answer. There's what works. It's, uh, it's, uh, a question of, of what is that to be less misleading to the people, given where they start and given where we want them to end up, given where we start and where they start, that there isn't a, that there isn't a provable best answer. There isn't a discovery to make about whether fatigues exist, and if so, what they are. Uh, that's just, uh, that's not the way to conceive of this. Well, so well, that's about where I was when I wrote the paper, Real Patterns which uh, 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 James and Don have uh, picked up. And I'm delighted that they have found the notion useful. They have gone running with it in ways that I didn't imagine. I don't know whether I'm going to come along with them on that ride. They're free, of course, to take it wherever they want. Uh, uh, and I won't take any more credit than just having uh, sparked the idea in them. Uh, but I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is dig in my heels a bit because I don't, I don't think I'm ready to go on the, on the uh, uh, really interesting journey that they want to take. At least I'm not ready yet. This may show I just don't understand. 